I want to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Caddy Borner from uh, 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 Indiana University. Uh, Caddy is the, uh, the uh, Victor Ingve uh, <laughs> Professor of Engineering and Information Science. Uh, and, uh, and she's going to uh, uh, lead us uh, through this uh, uh, data visualization mini course. Thanks, Caddy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a true pleasure to be here. Thanks for the organizers um, for putting this all together. I have been learning a lot and sending out a lot of emails this morning to friends and colleagues, informing them about all the good work you are doing here. Um, this particular uh, presentation and course is typically conducted over 15 weeks with eight hours per week. <laughs> I have like 40 minutes to make this all work, but I brought some friendly books over there. So if you need more information, it is actually written up so that you can refer back to it and read it uh, at your own time. But um, I will try to give you an overview over what we mean by data visualization literacy, how to define it, how to measure it, how to improve it. And um, for those of you which like to have copies of slides, I tweeted about them this morning. So if you go to at KDCNS, which is my Twitter handle, then you can get them. You also have a subset of these slides as handouts on the tables in front of you. If you don't have a copy, there are some extra ones here. So feel free to follow along. So what do we mean by data visualization literacy? We believe it is the ability to read, make, and explain data visualizations. And we deeply believe that in today's time and age, you have to be able to read and write text, but also you need to be able to read and make sense of data because it's a data-driven uh, environment, and ideally you make data-driven decisions in your personal and in your professional lives. Um, in order to be literate, you have to have basic literacy, so you need to be able to read and write text because many of the data visualizations come with labels on their axis. They have a title, they might have a description that explains what kind of data was used and what kind of algorithms were used to uh, uh, render these visualizations. Um, you also need visual literacy, which is very well defined. There are um, extensive standards on what uh, visual literacy means and how it's measured on a global scale. And you also need to have data literacy, which is typically coming from statistics and math. So you need to be able to read, communicate um, data. But you need all three of those in order to make sense of data visualizations. And um, I have been doing this kind of research over 20 years now. And I believe that if you only read data visualizations, but you never make one, then you really have a hard time reading them. It's just like painting. If you just look at paintings, but you never get to make one, it's really hard, or knitting, or any of these abilities. So what we have been trying to do is to make tools um, which make it super easy for my mom and many like her to read in a CSV Excel file, and then to point the tool at different columns and to really help them understand what kind of um, data visualizations, they can extract out of what kind of data. So we also have been running studies just to get kind of like a baseline of um, what kind of data visualization literacy normal human beings have. Because I keep surrounding myself with people which love data visualizations, can read data visualizations, and can make them. So I might have a very distorted view of what the normal baseline is. And so we went into science museums, six science museums in the US, and we asked a thousand youth and their caregivers um, to name and interpret and uh, envision how else these visualizations could, used, could be used. And it turns out that um, those which make it into science museums, if they are not in high school, and if they are not um, in a STEM job, then their data visualization literacy is rather low. It's basically comparable to what you have in USA Today in the lower left corner. <laughs> this is the baseline. That's why they are rendered this way in the lower left corner. So you have three bars, not four. You have maybe one or two pie slices, not more. This is the, and there are very few scatter plots, if ever. I, I actually don't have, I haven't seen a USA Today with a scatter plot. But if you find one, <laughs> share it with me, please. 
So there is a paper on this which reports our results there, but it's, it's, it was actually hard to get that paper published because many people claim, well, we know this is true. And I'm like, well, then we should do something completely different than what we have been doing so far. Um, so what we have um, been trying to do is to develop what we call uh, macroscopes. Um, so those are not telescopes or microscopes, which you might have at home. But um, macroscopes, as we understand them, they are bundles of software where any day new data sets become available, new algorithms become available, and you have an easier way to access these new data sets, to read them into your tool, but also to plug and play new algorithms, data readers, pre-processing, data analysis, um, connections to APIs that give you now deep learning and other functionality, but also, of course, to visualizations which help communicate the results of these analysis to others. And in many cases, you want to save out the result because you want to make that cover on a major journal, or you want to have it in your paper, or you want to have it in your slideshow, et cetera. And so macroscopes then help us find patterns and trends and structures in large-scale data sets or small-scale data sets. It doesn't have to be large. Um, these tools are then taught in the information visualization MOOC, where every spring we have students from 100 countries come in and work together. And these are all ages, many different uh, disciplines of science, and many different needs. And we help these students answer when, where, what, and with whom questions using temporal, geospatial, topical, and network analysis and visualization. So if you go there right now, you can join the asynchronous version of the course. It's free to take. Um, and if you come back next January, you could take it for uh, credits if you want to sign up with IU. We have 100 students from Indiana University taking this, this course, for, course for credits. But you can also come in for free. And if you're doing very well and you do your eight hours a week for 15 weeks, then um, you can get a Mozilla badge for your LinkedIn website. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I'm just telling you the truth here. So we have students come in. We have a lot of faculty members come in, which is very intimidating because these are my heroes. They come in and see me talk, teach. And still, I think it's a wonderful way to um, communicate um, what I know, but also then to benefit from these other faculty members, these other students, and to learn together what works and what doesn't work to ultimately empower many to render data into actionable insights. And so this is the uh, course schedule. There are seven hands-on and theory sessions. Um, there's a midterm and a final exam. Um, and then there's part two, another seven weeks, where people where students and teams of four to five work on real-world client projects. So another way to participate for you very concretely is if you have a data set and a question, could be a very practical question or a research question, and two hours of your time, you can become a client for these students which actually love to have those projects on their portfolio. They oftentimes continue working on those projects over the summertime, partially as interns, sometimes they are hired to do this work continuing. And in many cases, um, there's either a website or a paper coming out, which can then be used to show here, this makes a difference. We should invest in this if you're a smaller company. Or yes, this makes a difference. I should hire one of these um, students or pe people which have this kind of expertise. And what we do in the course is to um, tell students that um, every single science out there they're, they need to make sense of what they see in the real world. And what I see in the real world is a lot of different data visualizations. Animal researchers, they would see a lot of different animals. And then they would spend a lot of their time trying to find a taxonomy or something that helps them understand where to put the penguin and where to put the other interesting animals. And ultimately, they all agree on this, ideally, but they will fight for a while until they come back with a taxonomy that really helps them agree on this. Um, in information visualization, we do not yet have a well-defined um, taxonomy um, of even how to refer to these many, many different data visualizations. Um, we do have um, different frameworks that look at user insight needs, at user task types, at what data is to be visualized, what data transformations are involved to get from the raw data to the visualizations. Um, there are some others um, 
which um, argues that um, visualization techniques should be used to classify these different um, visualizations. Other frameworks, yet again, they tell that visual mapping transforma transforma transformations are most important for understanding what is really um, important for um, generating these visualizations. And then, of course, you want to have interaction techniques and so on and so on. So there are many different approaches which you could use to bring order to all of these visualizations. Um, there are also definitely different question types. Um, so oftentimes, we um, have clients on the left, um, and ideally, they have digital da data. We don't want to really OCR all of this, but, but ideally, they come with digital, ideally real-time data. And again, in some cases, it's small data. In other cases, rather large data. And then we develop this black box, which uh, contains predictive and analytic models that then helps them understand patterns and trends and outliers in their data, helps them find their way in a, in a large problem-solving space, uh, find collaborators and friends who identify trends in the data. They also oftentimes are operating on different levels of abstraction. Sometimes it's on a very personal level, me and my collaborators or friends, and I want to understand uh, that network and how it evolves over time. Or um, group level, my department or my school or my university, and how does it evolve over time? Or in your case, it might be geospatial regions and how they thrive or not. Um, and then, of course, there is the macro level, the population level. Um, so you can take these task types and these uh, levels, and you can create a table like this, where every cell basically has a level, micro to macro, and different task types. And so there are statistics, which you all are very well familiar with. But then there are also tasks such as temporal analysis, answering when questions, um, geospatial analysis, for where questions, um, topical analysis, linguistic techniques um, for what questions, and then network um, data analysis and visualization for understanding um, how networks evolve over time, what structures they have, how information flows over these networks, etc. So now you could go into every one of these cells and you'd say, well, if I have a big data set, I probably need some parallel processing and computing. I need a big database. If I'm on the micro scale, maybe I can even plot this by hand. If it's just five nodes and their linkages, I can probably do this without any kind of help. Um, however, you also now get to see where you need to uh, make friends. If it's a what question you have, then you need to find a linguist. If you have a where question, then cartographers, geographers, they are good at this. So I think it helps you already kind of find what you um, need to do in order to be successful. Ultimately, you will have this needs-driven workflow design. And we had a similar... Uh, circle, iterative circle on the um, wall here this morning where um, you start with the questions and you try to get your hands on the data sets that you can afford in the time and the budget you have. And you ultimately also take that data, you read it into a tool, you analyze it, and you visualize it. And it has to be simple. One, two, three. Read, analyze, visualize. Then as part of the visualization, we distinguish creating a base map, selecting a reference system, which could be just two axes for a scatter plot, could be a map of the US or of the world for a geospatial map, could be a network layout if you are interested in understanding networks. Then next, so that's your select visualization type. Then you overlay the data, and you get to see patterns and trends and outliers. Uh, so you can do this also for a geospatial map. And then you might have additional data um, columns, which you could use to color, shape, and size code your different elements. And that's the visual encoding of data. Then you deploy it all. And depending on what kind of deployment you do, if it's a large tiled wall or a printout or a phone, makes a huge difference in terms of what you have to do before you get to the deployment state. If you have very little screen size, you have to aggregate more, you have to filter more, you have to zoom in more to, to really see something. If you have a, a high-resolution printout, maybe you can show it all. And by the way, people are very comfortable with paper, much more comfortable with any kind of interactive data visualization. So oftentimes when we print things, um, that's when people really get to see their data and they start annotating and uh, discussing the data issues as opposed to, how do I read this? So I think that's where you want to go. Um, 
In terms of um, validation and interpretation, oftentimes you might not get initially the um, answer to your question because you might not have the right data or all you see is data issues and problems. Or what you're really now interested in is to zoom into a certain area. So you go all this cycle again, you read in new data or purchase more data, try to first of all get the budget to get that uh, data purchased, and then you do it all again. Or you need a different filtering because you want to exclude a certain subset of the data you have or bring in another subset. Um, so this cycle is oftentimes done iteratively many, many, many times. And ideally, ideally, you get to ask um, new questions, not just to answer the question you started with, but to ask novel questions because you can. And, and that's, I think, the most powerful part of it. Now, in order to support this iterative um, development of data visualizations, it's useful to have some guidance because you have 100 different choices, if not more. And um, it starts with the different insight need types where you have to decide if you want to just um, look for trends or if you want to look for um, correlations or if you want to see distributions or do you want to rank something. All these have very different uh, ways to be um, then impacting the data, uh, filtering, sorting, analysis, visualization. So really understanding what you want to um, see and what kind of inside need types you have is, is important. You also have different data scale types. It um, makes no sense to um, take a categorical variable and display it as um, an interval variable. You just shouldn't be doing this, and I will give examples later on. Um, you might also like to decide if your user group uh, can read a network or if all you can do is to display a table. In some cases, tables are just fine, especially if you can sort them, et cetera. And in fact, I would argue if you can display it as a table, just use the table um, because people can read it. That seems the good thing about tables. There's, it's not clear that everybody out there can actually read, uh, let's say, a um, proportional symbol map or an, 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 a scatter plot. Um, then you have different graphic symbol types, which you can overlay over these base maps. So let's assume you have a map of the world. You can then overlay either points or lines or areas, depending on what you want to um, visualize. You can also overlay linguistic symbols and symbolic symbols. Uh, and that's where this um, big table will come in in a moment. And I hope everybody has one of these. Um, you also have graphic variable types, which you can use to then color, shape, size codes, so uh, geometric symbols. And ultimately, you have different interactivity types, which you can use to further drill into the data. After you got your overview, you can filter and uh, get details on demand, as Ben Schneiderman would say. So behind each one of those um, columns, there are is a lot of work. So many pioneers have tried to bring order to this. So here I just zoomed into the um, inside need types, also called basic task types. Jacques Bertang um, initially um, wrote the most seminal book in, 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 on this topic, I, will, I, would, I, would, I would argue. And he um, basically captured um, four of the ones which, which are now widely used. And then others came along, and they identified and named other types of uh, tasks and inside need types. And uh, on the um, right-hand side, you also have some industrial tools that also try to help their users make sense and understand when to use what kind of visualization and what kind of analysis. And then on the very right-hand side, you have the ones that I'm going to use uh, subsequently. Um, you can also take two of these columns and you can tabulate them again, just like you saw the table initially. And so you can, for instance, take these um, graphic variable types versus um, graphic symbol types. And actually, this table is much larger, so um, and this NAS stuff kindly printed them all. And so what um, ideally you do is to um, take the entire set of four and you would glue them together like that and it goes, of course, also downwards. And I would, ha I would need four hands here. <laughs> Actually, Patrick, if you, if you could help here, these yeah, two. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is how you would glue them all together, right? Um, 
Now what you have is different, um, 95th centium. Um, so you have points and lines and areas and surfaces and volumes. Many of you have actually scientific data visualizations where you might have very well volumes. You then have all kinds of labels on those. And you also have pictorial symbols, um, such as um, journal faces, for instance, or um, symbols that you see in cartography often. Uh, going downwards, um, you have um, different elements, such as spatial positioning, but then also retinal symbols, such as size, and shape, and rotation, and curvature, and angle, and uh, closure, and value, and um, value and hue and saturation for colors. But then you also have, I have to cheat sheet here, um, you have, I have this one, huh. um, I, thanks so much. Um, um, you, you also have uh, further down uh, texture elements, which are used in uh, cartography, but not so much yet in data visualizations, but which are very effective. Many of them are pre-attentively processed. Many of them are pre-attentively processed. Um, you also have optics such as transparency, shading, and stereo stereoscopic depth. And for many of those which use augmented and virtual reality setups, those are extremely useful and, and very effective. And ultimately, you also have um, motion elements such as speed, velocity, and rhythm. If something blinks, we can't help it. We just have to put our attention there. And so these are very good for um, warning symbols. Something is really, really toxic. You really, really has, have to take care of it immediately. Something, again, which can't be done in printouts, but which can very well be done in online interactive data visualizations. Now, um, typically, you now have the large space of how you could encode your data. But what you really need to know is, well, I have my Excel file. Which ones should I use? And um, Raya, in her presentation right after me, she will have good guidance on which ones are best for our human visual system. It might be different for other beings, but for us humans, we know actually very well which ones are most dominant and then which ones are second uh, best and so on. And so um, I would like you to watch for this carefully in, in her presentation because I'm not going to cover it, even though it's very, very important. Um, we also have the, um, one of our tools, um, the Sci2 tool, the Science of Science tool, which was developed to analyze the structure and dynamics of science and technology developments. But it's also used in the IV MOOC to help many render data effectively into insights. And so in the tool, in the menu system, as you see, you can load a file. You can also um, generate a file. You can then prepare the data. You can pre-process the data. You can analyze, model, and visualize the data. There is a bridge to R for those of you which like to work with R. You can bring the data over there. You can bring it back. Um, you have a data manager and workflow manager so that you can reproduce anything you did. There's also a work log generated at the same moment. But what this tool also does is it implements the visualization framework. So here, as you see, you have temporal, geospatial, topical, and network analysis again. And if you go into in networks, then you get only those algorithms which are relevant for network um, pre-processing in this case. If you go to analysis, again, you have temporal, geospatial, topical, and network analysis. And if you go to networks, you only get those algorithms which are relevant here. And given that there are about 180 algorithms in this tool alone, it's really useful to actually have them categorized this way. Also, oftentimes you might pre-process a data set and then you want to run different types of analysis. So you would take one data set and you do a temporal analysis, geospatial and network analysis, all on the same data set to view it from different vantage points. Um, you might also um, then want to visualize that network. And again, you can in integrate entire tools. Here we integrated GUESS and Cytoscape, which some of you might be familiar with. These are widely used network analysis tools, and they basically just come up with the network loaded. Uh, we also have Gephi in here for those which um, prefer that tool. And again, it's just helping you to have one interface to all these different tools which now exist for doing these different types of analysis. Um, here, for instance, you have one data file where um, you have a 
set of publications, uh, and in this case, it's it's my publications to pick on my my own here. Um, so you have time cited, you have the publication year, you have the city of the publisher, the country of the publisher, journal title. This is just normal metadata which comes with a paper if you download it from the Web of Science or um, Scopus Elsevier databases, or if you have your EndNote BibTeX file, it's the same data. What you can now do is to point the um, tour to different um, columns and uh, get different statistical analysis done. You can also point it to the year and the keywords and run burst detection by uh, John Kleinberg, Cornell University, which identifies sudden increases in usage frequency for these words. And you could also apply this to toxicology data and just see how many people complained about a certain smell in a certain area and how sudden of an increase in calling about that issue you experienced in a data set. So I think this, these are very, very general algorithms that can be used. You also have um, geospatial analysis, so we support um, proportional symbol maps and uh, chloroplast maps. Um, you have topical analysis, including overlays on maps of science, because that's what we specialize in. You have uh, network extraction and um, also bimodal network extraction, so people and their diseases or um, um, different institutions and people which um, publish in different journals um, at these institutions and so on. Um, what I wanted to do, because um, I wanted you to feel comfortable with this approach, is to take some of the visualizations that we have seen today, and it was wonderful that um, Tim already introduced this particular visualization to you, because I, I feel uncomfortable introducing it to you experts. Um, but um, see how this would actually be applied. So if you now, um, for instance, take that big table and you try to understand what is going on here, then obviously the reference system, which is used here, are two axes. This is the simple and easy to read reference system you have here, check. Um, then you have a background which is used to indicate how toxic it is. I would argue that you might like to have a little legend that puts values on this if possible. Um, and values could be um, ideally um, very, very easy to understand. Like if you're exposed for one hour, you're in real trouble. If you're exposed for, to one minute, maybe not so much. I think it would be very important to actually um, indicate what these colors in the background mean. At the same time, then, um, you also have, um, in this case, um, uh, different um, points, which you saw in his slides prior to this. But you now also have a distribution on both axes. And that's um, a curvature in, 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 in this particular table because um, you actually indicate um, here the um, um, prevalence of, of uh, in this case, um, exposure and uh, toxicity. Now, when you look at the uh, contour lines, um, I think it would be helpful for many to also indicate um, what the value of those are. So right now they are, they are grayed out, but I think many people will ask, well, why is this gray and not colorful like, like the rest of the background? And I think that we could discuss and, and potentially also um, uh, talk about. When I saw first this um, visualization, I thought, well, shouldn't the um, gray oval kind of be bounded by the red line and the, the top and the lower point? Shouldn't this just be going over? And similarly, for the blue part also, shouldn't it be bounded by those for the ellipsoids? And it's sometimes it's just small things which um, could make it rather hard for, for non-experts to read these kind of data visualizations. Um, but in general, I, I believe this is a very, very um, effective data visualizations and data visualization. And when I um, met with Tim in the hallway, uh, I thought, well, maybe he actually wants to make carpets out of this. And those could be silk carpets, which can be easily printed in China, shipped back. You can have a ball like this, which is like three by three meter, or maybe even more, because silk is pretty easy to compress. You could spread it out on the floor. You could ask people to stand on those. And you would immediately see if they realize um, what they are doing. And, and I think these human scatter plots, in this case, <laughs> are very effective in getting people to think through what this actually means for them and what kind of actions they should do based on this. And I'm looking forward to discuss more with Tim about 
what else could be done to, to make this even more easy to read. But again, I was very impressed to, to read the papers that comes with it, which really explains in minute detail how to really interpret um, this particular um, visualization. Another one I get to um, discuss is the one by David Reif. And um, he asked me to tell you all that there is a new version of his software. Um, and there is a paper that's under review, so I can't tweet about that link he shared with me. But um, uh, it is much improved. And I also got a chance to ask um, David why in the world he used uh, pie charts. Because in his course, he actually teaches about um, Tufta's uh, lectures and lessons learned for all of us. Um, and Tufta, as you might know, um, really argues strongly against the usage of uh, pie charts. And he argued, and I think this is perfectly fine argument, that um, the audience he was working with, the stakeholders for which this visualization is meant to be insightful, they need to be engaged. And if they see um, bar graphs, which you could use here, and it would be much more legible for human beings, um, they would just walk away. They don't want to look at another set of bar graphs. For that very reason, it is perfectly fine, I believe, to use rather unique and potentially very hard to read um, <laughs> visualizations. Because if you cannot attract their attention, everything is for nothing. If they don't even come over, all that work you have put in in curating the data, getting the data to begin with, and curating the data, analyzing it, visualizing it, it's all for nothing if they don't come over or if they don't download it, if they don't look at it, if they don't engage with it, it doesn't make a difference. And I think all of you in this room are here because you want to make a difference. And um, I think he, he did a fine job. And what we discussed doing is to potentially, just potentially, um, add a toggle box, a toggle button where they could get the bar graph, which is really much easier to read, <laughs> and then flip back um, and get back to this um, symbolic representation, which in your uh, large uh, table would correspond most closely to the churn of faces. And um, those of you which have worked with churn of faces, you know you can have some smile and frown, and they can have big eyes and small eyes. And basically, it's, it's read in a very holistic manner. And I think the other reason why you might also like to have these symbols or turn off faces is because you want to see, you want your audience, your stakeholders, to perceive this data in a much more holistic manner. If they see four bar graphs or three so that you can make sure that they can all read it, um, then they might see three data points. If you show them a Schirner face, they will read it as a face, or in this case also, they will read it in a more holistic way. Um, ultimately, I would recommend to also use the uh, Color Brewer. It's a tool that Cynthia Brewer put out uh, for free. And um, that tool helps to optimize colors so that they are distinguishable in black and white, that they can also be read by colorblind people. And as you know, quite a number of, um, especially male, are red, uh, green, colorblind. Um, so you might like to make sure they read it correctly as well, and so on. So I think there are a number of um, elements that are all already um, taken care of if you use the color brewer in R or in, in, as an API or just online, just copy out the RGB values, basically. But um, Anyway, I was very interested to explore that tool in, in more detail. And again, it's, it's wonderful to actually have David here also. And uh, please ask him about the new version of this tool. <laughs> now, I think I'm basically out of time because I also would like some time for um, discussion. But if you got interested, please, there are books right there which you can check out. And um, they probably are in your local library. There are more books. Um, most of them are on analyzing and visualizing science itself. So analyzing very large-scale publication, patent, grant, news, social media, clinical trials, and other data sets to really understand how science works and operates. Um, but that might be interesting for you as well, especially if you are interested in doing a self-study of how your research area evolves here in the US, how it evolves in Europe, what is done in Japan, and how you can look for cross-fertilizations. 
Uh, I think science today is very global. The job market definitely is global. You might like to actually really understand where you are in that landscape of science, where your research is, whom you might like to partner with, where to get the best graduate students or faculty members, et cetera. And so if you got um, interested in all of this, um, feel free to check out um, more publications on it or just come into the Ivy MOOC. Thank you.